Hello, and welcome to 37th and the World, the official podcast of the Georgetown Journal of International Affairs. The GIA is a student-run, flagship publication of Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. On 37th and the World, we dive into key global trends and speak directly with the experts working on these issues in areas ranging from conflict and security, human rights and development, science and technology, society and culture, business and economics, and global governance. Last spring, India suffered a crippling wave of COVID-19 infections that alarmed the world. With over 400,000 infections a day and oxygen and vaccine shortages, India's COVID crisis mounted pressure on policymakers to improve global vaccine distribution. Indeed, the Economist Intelligence Unit reports that while all developed countries are expected to achieve widespread vaccine coverage by late 2021, 85 developing countries will have to wait until 2024 at best. In order to reverse this trend by ramping up vaccine production, the Biden administration announced its support of a proposal at the World Trade Organization to temporarily waive intellectual property rights for these vaccines, sparking criticism from the pharmaceutical industry and other developed countries. In the following interview, Gajia sat down with Professor Lawrence Gostin, director of the Anil Institute for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown University, to discuss his views on the intellectual property proposal and the role of the United States in improving global vaccine distribution. Professor Gostin is also the director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Center on National and Global Health Law, the legal and global health correspondent for the Journal of the American Medical Association, and a member of the Board on Global Health at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. So the Economist Intelligence Unit reports that while developed countries like the U.S. are expected to achieve widespread vaccine coverage by late 2021, over 85 developing countries will have to wait until 2024 at best. So my question is, like, what's driving this disparity and aren't there global initiatives in place meant to avoid this exact problem? Yes. Okay. so um, first of all, um, it's an unconscionable uh, inequality, and I think it's, you know, one of the greatest moral catastrophes of our generation. Um, And uh, I think the United States and other high-income countries um, should be deeply ashamed of their response. Um, You know, what what occurs is um, a global supply shortage of vaccines um, combined with uh, high-income countries hoarding the vaccines for themselves. Um, So the United States, Canada, the European Union, the UK, um, bought advanced, um, signed advanced contracts with pharmaceutical companies um, for, for most of their doses, and they've hoarded those doses, just keeping them to themselves. And as a result, um, uh, the, the uh, low- and middle-income countries have been in crisis with uh, very, very few vaccines. So even though, you know, the U.S. has already vaccinated virtually all of its healthcare workers, frontline workers, and vulnerable elderly, um, poor countries are nowhere near even vaccinating their own health workers. And so their health systems are in, in collapse. Um, there was a mechanism that was supposed to prevent this, which is the COVAX facility, a joint WHO-GAVI alliance um, initiative. Um, but the, GAVI, but the uh, COVAX facility um, has been starved of dollars and starved of doses. And so it can't even meet its modest goals. <laughs> yeah. So... I think the situation in India has really shed or at least brought a lot of attention to the short supply of vaccines. And then recently, the Biden administration has announced its support of a proposal at the WTO to temporarily waive intellectual property rights for these vaccines, which is also something that many in the pharmaceutical industry and developed governments around the world oppose. 
So could you explain yeah. what this proposal might do and why has the Biden administration decided to support it? Okay, so let me just talk about India for a second, and then I'll go to answer that question. So, you know, another reason that there's a global shortage of vaccines um, is that India was supposed to be the vaccine engine of the world um, and was going to planning on exporting um, uh, a majority of its vaccine supply to low and middle income countries. And when it entered a crisis, um, the government ordered a ban on exports um, so that we could have more um, uh, domestic vaccination. And the result of that um, is, is that COVAX didn't even get the vaccine doses that it expected to. So I just wanted to make that clear about India. Um, and I do think India more, uh, tugs at the moral heartstrings of America and the world. Um, you know, the IP waiver um, is shocking. I never thought I would live to see the day that a U.S. government would support a waiver of intellectual property at the World Trade Organization. Um, I think the reason it did it uh, is, is that President Biden was under enormous pressure politically um, from progressives and global health activists and, and um, members of Congress in the Democratic Party um, to waive the, the to, uh, to, to uh, support the waiver. The, um, you know, on the very day that Biden um, announced his waiver, I was on a call with uh, uh, Dr. Tedros, the head of the World Health Organization, and uh, we had both agreed that the U.S. would probably never support the waiver, and, uh, but I had been lobbying the White House to do just that. And then later in the day, Biden shifted course. It was an historic landmark um, for the United States diplomacy. Yeah. So the pharmaceutical industry, along with a lot of developed governments like the EU, Switzerland, Japan, oppose the waiver, arguing it would reduce incentive to innovate, making it harder to develop vaccines and treatments for future pandemics. So how concerning is this? And how might the waiver actually impact vaccine distribution? Well, I think that the pharmaceutical industry is crying wolf once too often. Um, if, if we're ever going to waive intellectual property rights um, for a public health emergency, it would be now. And if not now, then when? Um, we've suffered a pandemic of historical proportions, something that none of us have ever experienced in our lifetimes. Um, the world is in uh, economic crisis uh, and it's in a health crisis. Um, and so now is absolutely the time um, not to allow business as usual um, to get in the way of um, vaccine production. Uh, I think the pharmaceutical industry is wrong. It, it, this is only a temporary waiver. Um, it's an industry that makes very strong profits. It's profited off of uh, huge government investments, um, both in, from NIH and biotechnology research and development, um, but also Operation Warp Speed. The European Union has subsidized them. So they're operating with a lot of public funding, and I think they have a moral obligation to be part of the solution and not be, not oppose um, having uh, other countries produce these vaccines. Because you need to have, if you're going to have enough supply, you need, you need to have regional vaccine hubs um, where vaccines are produced in places like, you know, Mexico, Brazil, um, Indonesia, uh, and certainly India. Yeah. So 
The proposal at the WTO actually requires a consensus of 164 countries, and right now it only has around 120, including the U.S. So do you think the Biden administration's decision, would it actually make a difference given that it needs a consensus of all 164 countries? Well, I think having the U.S. behind it is going to convince many other countries to support it, and particularly uh, the U.K. and the European Union. And I think once the U.S., the EU, and the U.K. are on board, it's very possible that that other countries will come on board. You know, the uh, by WTO rules, you don't have to have consensus. It's only that's been their um, protocols. Um, and so I'm hoping that the Biden administration is going to put on a lot of diplomatic pressure um, to get this passed at WTO. Yeah. So if but it still proposal, remains to be seen. We don't know. But it needs a lot it. of political muscle. So if this waiver is approved, could you estimate how long it might take for vaccine production to ramp up? And are there any other steps besides just this waiver that is also necessary to create these regional hubs that you talked about? Yes, it's going to take months and, you know, maybe in some places a year. Um, and it's going to require a, an IP waiver. Pharmaceutical companies and governments are going to have to transfer the technology. There's going to be a, have to have a lot of financial assistance to build up capacity in the, these manufacturing hubs and also a lot of technical assistance um, to get a skilled workforce to be able to do it. Um, so, but we need to go big and bold on uh, in the response to this pandemic. Weak and timid just doesn't work anymore. And do you think that the Biden administration is leaning towards this big and bold route that you talk about? No, not yet. <laughs> um, we're pushing them in that direction, but you know the United States has done. Uh, uh, big and bold in relation to a lot of other health crises around the world. Most the, the best model is AIDS and PEPFAR, um, but also we, we led on polio and smallpox eradication. Um, we led on the West African Ebola um, epidemic and the Zika epidemic in Latin America. So I think that there's a history and a tradition that's bipartisan in the United States, um, but we actually need to make that a reality. Um, I think the United States has been so suffered so badly from this pandemic um, that it's, it's lost its moral vision and it's been in, inward looking, and that has to change. So just looking back on previous health crises, some experts um, have also drawn a lot of parallels between COVID-19 and the AIDS epidemic, where nations were unable to access HIV treatment for years. Do you think that the U.S. and the international community is doing better this time around, or are we falling into the same trap? Oh, we're absolutely falling into the same trap. Um, the problem is, is that, um, uh, you know, with the AIDS epidemic, uh, we didn't feel it ourselves as much um, because we were, uh, it, was, it had already moved uh, a lot to sub-Saharan Africa. Um, you know, here we've had a huge impact on every part of our community. Um, and, you know, I, and we've spent, you know, trillions of dollars on our own domestic um, response and recovery. And whether or not we can come up with more billions and trillions for the global response um, remains to be seen. So do you have any final thoughts or recommendations that you would like to share? Um, yes, I think um, President Biden should work 
um, with Congress and with his allies, with our allies and the G7 and the G20, to come up with something that's big and bold, which includes a um, a huge donation of our own vaccine supplies um, and uh, uh, of. Uh, so we want to have enormous quantities um, of vaccines donated. Um, and uh, then we want to pressure the pharmaceutical industry to transfer the technology and Congress to provide the funding for technical assistance and capacity building uh, in lower income countries. This was 37th in the world. Thank you to Professor Lawrence Gossin and our interviewer, Claire Wang. Please be sure to subscribe and leave a comment and rating whichever streaming platform you use. To read this interview and other insightful interviews and articles, please check out to gia.georgetown.edu. Thank you for listening and see you next time.